Do you know, I, I, every so often I try and move books around here and sort of find out what's under the piles and pretend to organise things a bit. But I usually get distracted, you know, as soon as I've picked a book up, I think, oh, that's interesting, and I'll read it. And a little while back, I, I was part, moving piles of books around here, and I came across this gorgeous little thing, which I'd almost forgotten I had, although I know its contents by heart. The Roubaix, I said, come over here, let's have you... Uh, George, of course, is right in the way. But um, let me just show you. Um, this is this is just such a, a kind of a delicate little thing. We'll put it. No, that's the dragon my mother gave me. Now we open up the little box, and here is this beautiful little volume, and it's bound in silk. It's a really lovely thing, and you'll see it says silk binding. And look at this. It was ten pounds. Oh, not very much, is it? And what it is is a lovely folio society. Uh, edition from, from the middle of the last century of a very famous poem, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, the first version made by Edward Fitzgerald. It's originally a medieval Persian poem, but it became very famous. Look at these lovely illustrations. So what distinguishes this edition is that um, rather than having the rather lush, lavish, sumptuous late 19th and early 20th century sort of Orientalism fantasies about Persia. This actually has genuine Persian miniatures, which are the first known illustrations of this poem. And they're beautifully, beautifully reproduced. It's just a gorgeous volume. And uh, all the things are there. So, you know, there we are. Look, here with a with a loaf of bread beneath the vase of the bow, a flask of wine, a book of verse, and now beside me singing in the wilderness. And wilderness is paradise in now. It's all there. So um, let's let's you make yourself comfortable, and um, I'm going to um, read you a little bit of, of um, just a few choice verses of the Rubaiyat, um, and then tell you an interesting thing that sort of arises from it, which is a bit about how writing itself works. So I, I scarcely need to read this to you because again, this is a poem that entered deep into me quite early on. In fact, my mother loved this poem and she used to quote it quite a lot. I mean, sometimes chanting it so we could really enjoy it as poetry. But it was so familiar, she sometimes used it ironically. So, um, anyway, for example, the famous opening verse of this poem begins with the word awake. So, awake, for morning in the bowl of night has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight. And lo, the hunter in the east has caught the sultan's turret in the noose of light. I mean, it's gl glorious poetry. The, the form that Fitzgerald used is, was fabulous. It's a quatrain. It's four lines, each verse. And it's got only one rhyme sound right the way through. It's got, it's got three rhyming lines on one sound and then one unrhymed line, which builds you up for the final rhyming line on the fourth line of the quatrain, and he uses it superb, superbly. But the poetry of this, I mean, I remember my mother explaining to me when I, when I was trying to, ex I loved the sound, the morning in the bowl of night has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight. And when I was quite young, my mother explaining to me that um, when the caravanserai was setting off, you know, for the treks across the desert, the signal for everybody to get up and move was a stone flung in a bowl of water and the stone, sound of the stone hitting the little bowl that you had there, you know, still at the oasis, was the sign to get going. But the poetic image is the idea that it's very early, that the morning is just beginning, now the sun is just coming up, the stars are still, as it were, trembling in the sky and reflected in the clear water of the bowl. So the stone makes the ripples and the reflections of the stars scatter away and that's that puts the stars to flight. And then the rising sun, the first beam of the sun, catching the sultan's turret, the metaphor is a noose. Now remember my mother explaining this to me, and it, she didn't say, well my dear, it's a metaphor, but actually I suddenly saw how poetry works, how you can put things in an astonishing way, where the, you're saying one thing which has a beauty in itself, and yet it's carrying something more with it. But equally, sometimes when I was oversleeping, Mum would use this verse, you know, wryly and say, awake for morning in the bowl of night has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight. Or else she'd take one of, there's another verse in this poem where um, it says, our love, couldst thou and I with fate conspire to grasp this sorry scheme of things entire? Would we not shatter it to bits and then remould it closer to the heart's desire? 
And you can use that about all kinds of things, including, of course, the present circumstances in which we find ourselves. I couldn't commend this uh, to you highly enough. It, it's elegiac. It has some sense of um, some sense of the passing of, of time and the passing of people, and it's gently um, and tenderly wistful about our mortality. But it celebrates and savors the day, and, and um, uh, so famously, um, you know, come fill the cup, and in the fire of spring, the winter garment of repentance fling. The bird of time has but a little way to fly, and lo, the bird is on the wing. But then it has the sort of, um, you know, coming out of that Islamic culture, it has the sense of of, of the fatalism and of what's there, you know. Um, Tis all a checkerboard of nights and days, where destiny with men for pieces plays. Hither and thither moves and mates and slays, then one by one back in the closet lays. Um, which, of course, um, is all the more emphatic because it doesn't even have an unrhymed line. It keeps that one sound rhyming through all four lines. Um, let me just uh, read you, uh, and then I want to, to, to develop something from this, um, the final verses of this, this very beautiful poem. Uh, which um, it follows on from the verse I just quoted about a love couldst thou and I with fate conspire. And then here are the final two verses. Ah, moon, moon of my delight who knows no wane, the moon of heaven is rising once again. How I hoft hereafter rising shall she look through this same garden after me in vain. And then thyself with shining foot shall pass Among the guests stars scattered on the grass And in thy joyous errand reach the spot where I made one Turn down an empty glass It's a lovely idea, drink to me when I'm gone um, Anyway, um, so I was rereading this having just discovered it And as I did, reading it in the present situation I suddenly thought you know, there's something about the tone of this poem which which resonates very well with the with the, the present uh, crisis, and um, I just wondered whether these quatrains might be a useful form to explore for some lighter, more occasional verse, and that I could start a series of um, quarantine quatrains. So, um, I particularly there's a verse just again towards the end. Alas, that spring should vanish with the rose that youth's sweet-scented manuscript should close, the nightingale that in the branches sang our ah, whence and whither flown again, who knows? Maybe it was the word manuscript as well. Anyway, I, it happens that I had, and, one, and I've just begun to write poems, the new poems for this quarantine period, in a manuscript book that a friend gave me, which, which um, has a, something of a sort of Persian feel to it. So as well as the, the, the specifically the poems of faith and the Easter poems that I've been writing in here, I thought I'd have a go at um, writing quatrains, and I've started them off, and I, they're, they're kind of in conversation with the Rubaiyat, so my opening quatrains start with um, the same word, awake, uh, but they're set for us in our time. So uh, let me just finish our little chat by reading this. This is, this is as it were, it's not even hot off the press, it's straight off the, the ink is scarcely dry on the manuscript, but uh, I may not be able to read my own writing, but here we go. So, quarantine quatrains. Awake to what was once a busy day. When you would rush and hurry on your way, snatch at your breakfast, start your grim commute, but time and tide have turned another way. For now, like you, the day is yawning wide, and all its old events are set aside. It opens gently for you, takes its time, and holds for you whatever you decide. This morning's light is brighter than it seems. Your room is rafted with its golden beams. The bowl of night was richly filled with sleep. And dawn's left hand is holding all your dreams. Your mantle clock still sounds its silver chime. The empty page invites an idle rhyme. This quarantine has taken many things, but left you with the precious gift of time. Your time is all your own, yet not your own. The rose may open 
or be overblown. So breathe in this day's fragrance whilst you may, to each of us the date of death's unknown. Then settle at your desk, open your pen, and open the old manuscript again. The empty hours may tease you out of thought, yet leave you with a poem now and then. So, to be continued, I think I'll carry on with those quatrains a bit and see where they lead me. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>